Okay, so we're gonna start um, the gentle yin today with uh, a posture we often start with, which is a half butterfly. So we simply bring that right leg out straight, <coughs> left foot to the inside of the thigh. And then very important, you want to relax. So notice my foot isn't, I'm not flexing it and pointing it up, it's relaxed. Upper body, relaxed. Arms, relaxed. And I just let gravity pull me forward and down. I want to feel a stretch here, the back of my thigh. Might feel it in my back as well. And if um, any of the sensations get too intense, then feel free to use support. So something under your forehead, your forearms, something under your left knee for support. Okay, those are generally the areas that you would use it. The other way to use props is actually to intensify it. So I see people in class who look like this in this posture. Even though they're, this is their relaxing forward and down, they're almost vertical because there's just so much tension here. So for those people sitting on something, <clears throat> it lifts the pelvis and hopefully you can understand the physics of what would, would happen. As you lift up, the, the pelvis is tilting forward. If you imagine that my hips just lifted and lifted and lifted, right? My torso, if I keep my torso at this angle, it's beginning to tilt down as I lift up more and more. So that's a, a way that some people who have a lot of tension here can get a, a deeper um, or easier time of it because now their pelvis is tilted forward more. Gravity is pulling them forward. Here, basically, gravity is just pulling straight down. You're not really getting much help by gravity. And then if you're here, which some people actually are, then gravity is actually pulling you back. You know, so I sometimes see people in class like this. Okay, so we don't want that. So if this is you especially, then you're gonna bend this knee. You're gonna bend this knee, put a block under here is an option or a rolled blanket or something. And again, we want to feel the stretch here. I think all of you have taken class with me enough to know it's about that stretch. That stretch is what makes this a beneficial exercise, makes it worth our time, okay? So it's not the comfort, it's not the relaxation, it's not the breathing uh, that brings us the benefit of the yin practice. It really is the time that we are stretching here and here. And so in this particular posture requires very little effort. Once you're in it, you really don't have to do much else. You just hold it, just patience, um, you know, allowing. And that's not something, at least in our culture, um, currently that we're encouraged uh, to do very much. So many of us, the first time we encounter this idea of just allowing, it can be a very foreign concept. Like, no, am I, I'm supposed to do something, right? And it's like, no, just allow. <laughs> just wait. Just be patient, right? So this is, again, for many of us, we feel like, well, I should be doing something right now. No. Uh, the thing you should be doing is not doing anything, <laughs> if you want to think of it that way. Let's switch sides. So on a psychological note, interestingly, um, many people, when they first start doing yin yoga, they find it challenging for that reason. And that's not an uncommon thing. And it, the other thing I want to mention is it doesn't make you a bad person. It just means that you have an unconscious program running. Um, and again, if you're like, no, I don't, well, that's because it's unconscious. You're you're just not aware of it. There are many things most of us have programs running that we're just not aware of. And those programs affect how we feel. And generally human beings, uh, even though we love to think that we're logical and you know that everything we do makes sense, the truth of the matter is human beings are motivated mostly by how they feel even the ones that say that they're logical, okay? 
Um, in fact, very often, if you argue with someone who's very logical and you don't make sense, they will get upset because you're not being logical. But getting upset isn't logical, right? It's, it's an emotion. And so again, people are like, why can't you just make sense? Why can't you just be logical? It's like, you know, well, why are you getting emotional about me not being logical? So human beings, whether you are logical or not, are mostly motivated by how we feel, okay? How we feel. Um, and so how we feel is usually dictated by these unconscious programs that are running. And so in the case of yin yoga, when I'm having trouble being still, I'm having trouble holding, I'm having trouble not doing something. <clears throat> and again, these are things I've actually seen. I'm not, you know, talking theory here. I'm talking about actually, I've seen students who are the whole time they're in the pose, they're moving around, they're wiggling. And then I have other students who can be still but after the class, they report, yeah, that was really hard. That was really hard for me to, to be still, to, to hold that. Much harder than the active class that we do for those people. So again, for many of us, this feeling of discomfort, this feeling like I should be doing something right now, I should be making an effort, um, this is usually coming from, again, an unconscious place where Part of us believes that we shouldn't be relaxing. We shouldn't be still. We always need to be doing something. We always need to be producing something, accomplishing something. Even though we are, in reality, we are. But the unconscious program doesn't really see this as doing something. So there, there needs to be this constant activity. And part of that can also come from a unwillingness to feel certain emotions, to see certain thoughts. So one of the ways that we defend against that is by being really active all the time. All right, let's go ahead and unwind. We'll come onto our back. Let's just relax for a few moments. We call that feeling the rebound. Now this is where if you are like that, you're going to really struggle. <laughs> so see if you can just unwind onto your back and just don't do a thing. Don't hug your legs. Don't wiggle your hips. Don't adjust your shirt. Just be still for a few moments. Be vulnerable. Be open. Try and feel what's there in your body. This may seem inconsequential, but I can assure you on many, in many modalities that I've studied in spirituality, okay, from the teachings that I've studied with Scott Killaby, to yin yoga with Paul Grilly, um, to the Zen tradition, this is a game changer. Being willing to feel and experience what is arising is a complete game changer. And you might think you already know how to do that and that you're good at that or whatever. Maybe. <clears throat> but again, many of us without realizing it will push away certain things and reject certain things in our experience without even being conscious that that's what we're doing. All right, let's go ahead and bring our legs in. Give them a little squeeze, shake it out. <clears throat> so as my teacher Paul likes to say, you know, there's a yin and a yang to everything. There's a time to move and stretch and push away things, okay? It's not like it's we always are welcoming everything. So, you know, now is the time to say, okay, I don't like the way my back feels, so I'm going to try and move and get rid of that feeling, okay? Or I don't like the imbalance I'm feeling in X part of my body. So try and address it here. Do, do your best. All right, when you're done, just unwind back on your back. And let's move our hips to the right edge of our mat in preparation for banana. 
Okay, we're gonna take the left leg, just move that over to the left. And then from there, we can cross the right ankle over. All right, and then extending arms up overhead. What we'd like to do is pull the arms, head, neck, shoulders, pretty much as far to the left as we can go. Now for me, pulling's not enough. So I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna sort of wiggle myself over. Okay, and then I feel the stretch in my right waist and ribs. This is where we want to feel it, in this whole region. Anywhere in here is fine today, okay? So that's where we're trying to stretch. Now keep this hip down. I can't tell you how many times when I teach this posture in person, somebody lifts this hip way up and rolls all the way onto their side. And that's just not, it's not going to stretch this area. Not effectively, okay? So let's keep this hip. It doesn't have to touch the ground. See, I hate saying that because then, again, as human beings, we so often um, are dogmatic in just, uh, you know, uh, rule-based. We just, uh, without understanding why something is being said, we just then will often slavishly, you know, do something. So it's okay if the hip comes up a bit. But again, rolling all the way onto your left side is not effective. And so that's why I will say keep your hip down because that's going to keep you from rolling onto your left side. So, you know, if you're wondering what I'm talking about, I'm talking about people doing this. And I've, it happens all the time. As strange as that might sound, you might be like, well, how could someone do that, you know, based on what he's saying? I, you know, I don't know, <laughs> honestly, but it happens all the time. So that's what we're trying to avoid. So we keep that hip down. And then the other thing I'll mention is ultimately everything is optional. So if this hurts your shoulder, you could bring the arms down. Uh, you know, you can face to the left or to the right with your head. Uh, you can even switch the legs, right? Reverse the cross of the legs. Um, sometimes students will do this and actually get a little bit of a deeper uh, angle with the legs there. Okay. So again, if you understand my teaching, you understand it's not about rules. It's not about do's and don'ts, you know, like again, strict following orders type of thing. It's about trying to help you. So if I say, don't do this, it's because for most people, at least, um, doing what I'm telling you not to do is going to be either harmful or ineffective. And if for some reason it isn't harmful to you, for you or it's effective, then go ahead and do it. <laughs> That's how I feel about it. All right, let's go ahead and switch sides. <clears throat> okay, so we're over on the left side this time. Take a moment, try and feel that right side. See if you can feel the effects of that last stretch before you come into the other side. You know, just, so again, yoga is really about making conscious what is unconscious. All right. And that's also what I think Michael's here today and he's joining us from the uh, Killaby group. And you know, that's what Ki you know, the Killaby Inquiries is all about, too. It's, it's really what spirituality is about, ultimately, in my experience. So I think, you know, when some people hear me say spirituality, they think I'm talking about some kind of woo woo you know, out there experience or, you know, astral projection or something like this. In my, the spirituality that I have come into contact with that has helped me and helped other people throughout my life has very little to do with that. Now, I am not saying that people do not have those experiences. Okay. So I'm not saying that that's all BS or that those experiences aren't valuable for people when they happen. All right. 
But in my experience, those things are not replicatable. And they're also not, it's not important that they be replicatable. So some people, when they meditate, they go off into outer space and they have all kinds of weird experiences with beings and past life regressions and all kinds of things. Cool. Okay, that's part of their journey and their experience. And those experiences, like any experience we have, is valuable for them if they are able to uh, experience them in the right way. <clears throat> okay? Uh, other people will never experience anything like that. doesn't matter how much meditation they do, you know, how much breath work they do, how much inquiry they do. They just don't have those sorts of spacey, disembodied experiences. And here's the thing in my experience that I've seen over decades of teaching spirituality, it doesn't matter. The spacey sort of disembodied spiritual experience is not more spiritual or more valuable than embodied experiences. In fact, you might say the most advanced form of spirituality that I'm aware of is very embodied. This is one of the reasons why we have bodies. If we were trying to be disembodied, we wouldn't have bodies. And I know that this is a source of confusion for a lot of people because a lot of people think like the purpose of spirituality is to leave the body, like the body is somehow dirty and to be rejected and pushed away. Well, that's not the spirituality that I've been taught and that's not the spirituality that I teach, okay? All right, let's go ahead and unwind from that. And let's feel that rebound. <clears throat> So from the Zen perspective, the most spiritual thing you can do is to be fully human and to be fully yourself. You might think, great, I'm already doing that. No, chances are you're not. Okay. Again, most of us have these unconscious programs running that keep us from fully embracing and accepting and loving ourselves as we are. And as Part of that, we're also rejecting the human experience. When we reject a part of ourselves, we reject that in others as well. And in doing that, we're again kind of saying, I don't like people. I don't like human beings the way they are. Think about your own experience. Do you just love the way humans are? Do you love the way humans treat one another? Do you love the way humans treat the environment and the planet? Do you, are you just like, wow, humans are the greatest? Or do you look out into the world and, and see, God, like, why are people doing that? And it seems really horrible, right? At least it can. All right, let's bring those legs in, give them a little squeeze, shake it out. and then we'll hinge up, okay? So hands under hips, legs up, lift the head and neck, exhale, lower the legs, and then inhale and exhale, okay? Come on up. All right, <clears throat> so dragonfly is next. Probably wanna face the long side of your mat, but I'll leave that up to you. It's not necessary, it just keeps your heels on the ground. So. For some people that are heels on their mat, so that might cushion them a little bit. So this is it, right? Legs wide, straight, unless, again, if you're like this, when your legs are straight, you're being pulled backward. And again, the telltale sign is you're, you're reaching back and holding yourself up. Then sit on something and maybe bend your knees as well. We want gravity to pull us forward, not back. So I want, if I fell asleep, I want to do that. Okay. Not fall back onto my back. Okay. Again, feet relax, head, neck, shoulders, 
arms relax. You can put a block on your forehead, forearms you can support as necessary, okay? So I think you all know that at, at this point. So we just relax forward and down, <clears throat> letting gravity pull us into this shape here. So again, this sort of um, rejection of the human, um, actually in spirituality in the past, uh, some spiritual traditions actually embrace that and sort of teach that. And from my perspective, these spiritual traditions are, and again, it's just my perspective, so don't be offended if that's how you think or that's you know what you uh, you know i you can think whatever you want to think folks and you can believe whatever you want to believe the only thing i'll ask is that you don't get offended because i believe something else and i teach something else okay i'm not saying that you're wrong uh, i'm just sharing my experience and in my experience that is incorrect it's incomplete so there are spiritual traditions, many of them actually, that teach a rejection of the human experience in favor of this sort of, again, sort of disembodied, idealistic, angelic sort of experience that that is somehow higher and better in the experience that we're seeking rather than the human experience. So you see this in meditation traditions where people just spend all day in meditation and that's like, oh, that's good, right? You're being more spiritual. The world is dirty and full of, you know, nasty people and nasty experiences. So try and stay away from that. Go to the monastery and meditate, meditate, meditate. Well, it's pretty easy to be calm and relaxed and spiritual if you're living in a cloistered environment for me that really isn't the true test of your spiritual development in the zen tradition you have the ten bowls and in the ten bowls it the final picture is the person the individual the seeker back in the marketplace and in these ancient teachings usually the marketplace represented the world, worldliness, living in the world, 285 traffic, right? Um, Target, Walmart, think of like the most worldly, unspiritual thing you can think of. And that's what the marketplace was representing in this. And so the 10 bulls, the, the conclusion of the Zen journey is being back in the marketplace wait for it, indistinguishable from anyone else. So not in the marketplace glowing with people coming up to you and asking you, you know, how to be more spiritual. No. In the marketplace, indistinguishable from anyone else. Okay, let's go ahead and <clears throat> come out of that. Probably want to stay facing the side of your mat for this next one. Similar stretch right in the groin here. I'm sorry I didn't mention that. Hopefully you all got that. We're stretching the groin there. And you can have your feet together, apart, pointed, flexed, hips over the knees or back toward the heels. Just find that stretch in the groin. That's what we're going for today. Okay. So for me, that's very significant, the 10 bulls and the teaching of Zen. What it's the message is sending to me is that those traditions that taught that the goal was to have this spiritual experience, which Zen gives you, at least it gave me that. I had a, an experience that I can't put into words. I mean, many experiences um, by way of Zen meditation. Uh, 
otherworldly experiences, for lack of a better way of putting it, transcendent experiences, experiences where, you know, I knew myself to be more than this, okay? I, I had experiences of myself as a much greater um, presence or being than just this flesh and bones. Okay, great. What can happen with that experience is a rejection of this, and that's where the confusion comes in. So some traditions, you had this experiences, experience, and then sort of the tradition starts teaching like, oh, well, just that experience is real, that experience is transcendent, so you should try and seek that experience out more and more and more. What the Zen tradition teaches, and what Buddhism in general, I think, if you understand Buddhism, <clears throat> what it's teaching is an integration of that realization with the human experience. So not a rejection of human experience, but an integration of the realization of our true nature and that transcendent nature, right? Most people don't have that experience without practicing some kind of spirituality. So that's why for most people it is necessary to do some work because for most that doesn't happen spontaneously. Now, some people actually do have that. Uh, so it does happen. Some people are just walking in the woods and all of a sudden they have a realization of the interconnectedness of all things and themselves with it. And, uh, you know, maybe there's even a an experience of a sense of, you know, a God or some kind of, um, you know, ultimate being or creator or something like that. Again, different people, these experiences tend to be different and not replicatable in the exact same way. That's been my experience anyway. I'm not really studied with or worked with a teacher that is able to, like clockwork, you know, replicate these spiritual experiences for everybody. And it's like people have these transcendent experiences, but they tend to be very personal, even though they're transcendent. All right, let's go ahead and come on out of that. I recommend child pose. <clears throat> but if child pose is a stretch for you, in other words, if it hurts, then choose a different position. Maybe you lay on your belly, maybe you lay on your back. This pose for me is just relaxing. It's not really stretching much of anything. I can and actually have fallen asleep in this position before. That's how comfortable it is for me. So for some people, this will hurt your knees and hurt your ankles. And so, you know, you wouldn't be able to fall asleep if you're in pain there. So. <clears throat> All right, let's come up into tabletop. We'll do a little bit of the bear here. So we're just addressing again, lingering discomfort. You know, discomfort can come from the stretches. It can, uh, we can start the class with some discomfort. You know, either way, we're just trying to say hello to the different parts of our body, you might say, to wake them up, stretch them out, engage the muscles and the joints a little bit. When you're done with that, you can lift those hips for the down dog. And again, just stretch everything out, pedal it out, rolling over the toes, circling ankles, bending knees, things like that. <coughs> okay. Now we come into sleeping swan and we're going to be targeting this right here, the glutes. Um, okay. So that muscle group. So we bring that knee toward the right wrist, the foot across to the left side of the mat. And then you have lots of options. Um, you can stay in your hands. Three minutes is doable, but most people prefer to come down onto their elbows. Uh, your right foot, can be close to your left hip, 
but some people like to pull it up like this. I don't know if you can see that. They pull the shin bone up parallel with the front of their mat. And the foot can flex or point. That's up to you. Okay, you'll see I'm rolled all the way over here. That's because I don't have that much rotation in my hips. So the only way I could show you this is to uh, move my hips instead. So again, I, I know most of you if not all of you have not studied much anatomy, you may not understand the way these things work, but rest assured, if I were to push this left hip back to the ground successfully, I would tear something. I would probably tear my knee in order to do that. And the reason for that is this joint here is just not giving me the rotation. So it will come from here because this is weaker. The hip is generally stronger than the, the knee joint, okay? Um, so obviously I don't want to tear my knee. <clears throat> this knee can point straight ahead or out to the side. The hips can rock to the left or to the right. Some people like to put a block under this hip, which you're welcome to do. A little added support there, okay? And again, we just want to feel it in this region here. I'm definitely feeling it there. Um, we're getting the rotators, the glutes, the extensors and abductors. And again, as a group, I just call them the glutes. Uh, when I say glutes, it's including all of those different muscle groups there. So the Zen tradition, and again, the teachers that I've studied with generally are encouraging what um, my teacher Scott Killaby calls embodiment. <clears throat> so enlightenment, you could say, is the first part. Meditating, having a transcendent experience, having an experience outside of your ego self, your ego identity. For most people, that's the start of their spiritual journey. Um, it usually actually starts before that with a sense of longing or curiosity, um, you know, that's where most people start. They hear a talk like this one, they get interested in meditating, you know, maybe they've never been interested before. Um, or they are sick in some way and they want to heal. Let's go ahead and switch sides. That's another way that many people come to a spiritual path and a, a deep spiritual path because usually when it comes to healing the again i don't i'm never really trying to put anybody down or insult anybody so again you know i these aren't meant as like judgments uh evaluations of what others are doing but i do need to speak honestly at the same time so a lot of stuff that happens in spirituality is essentially, in my view, fluff. It's sort of almost like imaginative. And I'm not saying that isn't helpful for some people. It might be. But what you'll find is a lot of that imaginative stuff that, you know, works when you're relatively healthy and happy, right? You're in your 20s and, uh, you know, you've got your whole life ahead of you and you know, you join some cult or you follow some teacher and they, you know, teach you all this fantastical stuff. And again, maybe you have experiences or you drop acid and you, you know, you have some kind of fun experience. And, you know, sometimes those experiences can actually pique people's interest in getting into real deep spirituality. Some people do have trips on hallucinogenics, like, you know, whether it's mushrooms or LSD or something else that really can be healing and transformative. So again, I'm not trying to discount uh, anyone's experience or their journey, but what you'll often find is some of the more, I don't know, light or playful forms of spirituality. You know, when you get cancer, it gets really real. Uh, when you find that you have an addiction, to a substance and it's killing you or destroying your life, 
things get real. When you find that your work is creating a lot of suffering for you, um, you know, a lot of anxiety and, and maybe depression and, you know, it's causing you to actually do self-harm, things get real. And what I find is a lot of that fluffy, you know, stuff, fantastical, um, fun spirituality at that point very often drops away. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work. It, again, if I'm in my 20s and I'm healthy and woohoo, then like, you know, all day long, it can be fun and games and doing stuff. But at a certain point, if I'm sick, especially, or suffering in a real way, then I find there are only certain tools and certain teachers that tend to rise up in your awareness because it's like, it, that's what really is transformative and works. So it's sort of like you stop playing around with spiritual toys and you actually find the spiritual tools that work because you're desperate at that point, right? You're sick or you're suffering and you're like, I don't have time for this stuff anymore, for games. I need something that's going to work. All right, let's come on out of this. Um, just try relaxing on your belly if that's comfortable. That's what I recommend. All right, next is Sphinx or Seal. So you prop yourself up on your elbows. You can straighten your arms. Okay, legs can be together, apart, or in a full lotus. Head held up, drop forward or drop back. Shoulders depressed or relaxed. We want to feel a little bit of compression in our back, okay? <clears throat> So again, when we're really suffering, um, it's often suffering that motivates people to take their spirituality seriously. And I don't want to paint a picture again of like all or nothing, black or white. Okay? So I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. The practice we're doing this morning is yin yoga. And in general, in yoga tradition, this is called asana, which means postures. So some of you do the active asana class with me on Monday, and then we do this sort of more passive. That's kind of like a marketing thing. Um, you know, that's sort of uh, how I can sell these classes to people and sort of categorize it in a way. Um, probably if we were in a different setting, in a different environment, I mean, I wouldn't be like, oh, here's the yin or the yang. I mean, we might mix it up. We might do some of both. But in our culture, again, where people, it's kind of a marketplace, you know, people like, well, I don't like this, so I just want to do that. So, you know, we separate them. But that separation is a little bit of, um, I don't know what the right word is. Uh, I don't want to say arbitrary, but it, it's not completely real. Anyway. Asana, postures, very powerful tool, can be, but what I find in the West is it's usually overused. In other words, people who would benefit a lot more by starting to do some meditation or pranayam or inquiry, instead they're spending more, more time, more and more money, more and more effort trying to get better at doing the postures when the postures for the most part have already done their job. They're, they're not getting more benefits by doing more postures, right? They're getting less and less by doing more and more postures. Whereas if they would just switch to maybe chanting 
or again, meditation or doing some other practice, they would actually get a lot more from it. But they don't because they don't like doing those things, right? Or they're not good at it or whatever it is. So, um, all right, let's go ahead and come on down. So again, asana can be a great tool. Postures can be a great tool, but it can be overused. It can be abused. It can be misused. Um, and the thing that happens in the West often is it's overpromised what it can do. So many yoga teachers will talk about, you know, all the benefits of yoga and all this stuff. And they'll sort of make it sound like these postures are going to bring you all of that. And in reality, that's not been my experience. I've never seen anybody, anyone, who has taken the whole spiritual path just stretching, doing postures. I'm sorry, I've just not seen it. If you have, then let me know. But I'm also going to reserve my own judgment. I may not feel like this person is actually enlightened and embodied. They might claim to be, but I may not see that. That might not be what I see when I you know, listen to them or see them. All right, let's try another backbend. First thing I want to say is feel free to repeat that, okay? Because this next backbend may be too much for you. We press back to kneeling. You can sit on your heels, between your heels, on a block or even two or three blocks. The two areas that tend to give people trouble are the ankles, feet, and the knees. Okay, so ankles, pad them if they need it. Toes can point back or out to the sides. Knees, if they're bothering you, you can take them wider. You can sit on something, okay, reducing the flexion at the knee joint. From here, if I feel a stretch, I'm going to stay because this is already beneficial, just this stretch here. If I don't feel any stretch, then I can begin lowering back. Okay, hands, elbows, bolster, crown of the head, or maybe all the way onto your back. Okay, again, you keep going until you begin to feel a little bit of beneficial stress, which you know, is like a stretching or a gentle compression sensation. That's what we're looking for. If I don't feel any sensation, then there's a good chance not much is happening. Okay? So we want to feel at least a little something. So again, these different tools, these different things, um, you know, it's, it's again, not a black and white thing. So asana which I teach and I think is super valuable. I actually think it's really valuable for embodiment. Like I study with um, my teacher, Scott Killaby, and he teaches uh, inquiry, which is, it involves the body, but it, it's, it's, there's not a lot of movement, right? And so he, he advises people to go and do just sort of like whatever movement they like to do, which is fine. You know, he, he likes to lift weights and do things at the gym and that's good. But the yoga tradition, in my view, it was designed for this. It was designed to help us with embodiment. So I actually, you know, think and feel just based on my own experience that, again, you may not personally like yoga. You might not like stretching. You might get much more of a buzz by going for a run. Uh, or maybe you enjoy swimming or tennis or climbing. And I'm not saying there isn't value in doing those things. I'm also not saying that those things can't help you regulate, right? If you're feeling um, dysregulated from doing energetic work or inquiry, which is also energetic. Um, but again, what we'll find, I think, is that the yoga tradition, these postures, the practices that are part of this tradition are designed to do specifically that, to help with nervous system regulation, to help with embodiment, opening the body up, creating space in the body. Some people, when you try and do inquiry with them and you ask them to look for body contractions, they can't find any. Now that doesn't mean they don't have any, it means there's so much density and tightness 
that it's all a contraction. It's like their whole body is one big contraction. So when you ask them, hey, do you feel anything and tightness or whatever, they're like, no, I don't feel anything because it's like a solid brick. <laughs> so again, this is where yoga stretching, actually literally creating space in the body can start to help someone identify body contractions, things like that, which is very important when doing deeper work with meditation or inquiry, things like that. So my point is that, um, you know, asana can be used very skillfully by a, a teacher who knows what they're doing. It can be a really powerful, deep tool to help us with embodiment uh, and with enlightenment. But it can also be abused and misused, and it often is in the modern setting. Because for many teachers, it's the only tool they have, and it's the only tool they know how to use. And so they tend to oversell it, saying, oh, this is going to fix everything for you. Just do these stretches, do these classes, you know, and it's, it's not the case. All right, let's bring our legs in, give them a little squeeze. We're going to finish with a twist. So right knee over left, down to the left, like so. And be sure to experiment with your leg and arm and head position. Okay. And just find the optimal position for you. Getting a nice stretch into these different areas in the torso and around the torso. Also twisting the spine simultaneously. Really, really therapeutic. So again, I hope nothing I said today offended anybody or made anyone feel like I was putting down what other people are doing. My experience is, and, and um, you know, some of you uh, are patrons of mine on Patreon and you, you listen to my talks and stuff. Others of you just come to the class here. But those of you who've seen my talks before know that I've said in the past, and I say often because it's my experience is true, everyone's doing the best they can. Everybody. So think of the, the person you know who's the most pathetic or the most evil or the worst person that you know. They too are doing the best they can. You might feel like, well, they, they should be doing better or, or they could do better. That's your opinion, and you're welcome to have your opinion. Doesn't mean you're right. Okay? Doesn't mean you're right. So think of a politician that you hate, right? You probably have one. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, a Republican or a Democrat, whatever. There, you, there's somebody you probably hate on the other side of the aisle. That person's doing the best that they can. Given their experience, their upbringing, the programming that they were given, right? So again, most of us have programming that comes from very young age that we are unaware of. For most of us, it will require effort, curiosity, to become aware of the programming. Why is that important? Because when you're unaware of it, it again affects how you feel, it affects how you behave. It affects the decisions that you make. It affects your relationships. Do you have trouble with relationships? Do you have trouble with your partner? Arguments, you know, all kinds of things. Do you have problems with feeling ashamed or guilty or afraid or anxious? You know, these are things that come from these programs that we have. So the process of dealing with the programs is first becoming aware of them. Uh, and then once you have awareness of the programs that are running, you can learn to dissolve them. And generally speaking, I don't want to get too much into this aspect of it, but generally speaking, <clears throat> the yoga tradition has a teaching about Shiva and Shakti. Okay, Shakti is energy and it's sort of said that the shakti is down here in the pelvis right and 
one way of thinking of it is just kind of like sexual energy, but it's more than that. Um, it's definitely that's part of it, but think of it as like bi biological energy. In the yoga tradition, this would be like kind of root chakra energy, you know, earthy, uh, material, just, you know, uh, the stuff that makes up the world that we see and hear and taste and touch, right? It's energy, it's physical matter. And then you have what's called Shiva. And Shiva is consciousness, awareness, right? What is it that is experiencing this physical manifestation? What is it that experiences an emotion or a contraction in the body? What is that? That's the Shiva part, okay? What the yoga tradition teaches us is that if we can unite Shiva and Shakti, um, then we are unified. And a word for that is yoga. Yoga can mean unification. And that's the goal of all yoga practices. When I am able to unite my biological energy and my awareness when they become one where i'm not hiding things from myself motivations uh, beliefs ideas um, thoughts uh, memories when i'm not hiding those things from myself when i hide them from myself it will seem like motivations come out of nowhere again usually in the way of feelings Ooh, I feel insulted. I feel angry. I feel whatever it is. You know, we just want to understand where that comes from. We'll have certain situations, and they're called triggers, right? Situations where I get triggered. All right, let's go ahead and switch sides. <clears throat> So for most people, they don't question triggers and things like that. They don't question their emotions, their moods, their motivations. Most people actually identify with them. And um, this is actually talked about in the yoga tradition. I think it's in the fourth line of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. He basically says that if you don't know your true nature, then you will identify with these things. And that's what most people do. They will say, well, I just don't like this. And that person just pisses me off. And, um, you know, I get upset in these situations. And again, there'll be no real awareness of the why. You know, where is this stuff coming from? It just seems mysterious. If you get curious about the why, why do my... Why do I hate cocktail parties? Why do I like, um, or why do I, you know, drink too much? Or why do I feel like I always need to be high to relax? Why do I feel anxious all the time? Why do I go from one partner to another to another? Um, you know, whatever it might be, it shows up in innumerable ways in our lives. Um, then you can there are tools that we use in yoga and spirituality to tease out those whys the things that are driving those things and it does take time um and i was talking with a young woman the other day who um actually was you know on the verge of like beginning to get professional help because she's actually harming herself and she said she really doesn't like herself and um, I told her you know there are two things I can help you with the first one is raising your baseline because she experienced depression so I was like there's a lot we can do with yoga and just other things diet changes you know exercise to raise it up so you're not depressed anymore okay but the driver behind her feeling of lack of self-worth is what's called a deficiency story. And I said, that's going to take more work and time. 
And I said, and that's up to you whether you want to deal with that. Most people go to their graves without ever actually dealing with that. And, you know, they're okay. They're not depressed. They're not alcoholics. They're not falling apart. They're functional. But there's still maybe a good fair amount of suffering in their lives. And again, for many people, the only time they really get serious about spirituality is when the suffering is turned up. <laughs> so when it gets really bad, they're like, okay, I'm going to do something about this. Um, and they might end up finding themselves sooner or later in some sort of a spiritual uh, setting. Because in my experience, that's really the only way you can actually address this stuff. You know, modern drugs, psychology, medicine, science is just not prepared to take you all the way. We're, we're just not there yet. Maybe one day we will be, but we're just not there at this point in time. Ironically, the psychologists, the doctors, the scientists who are most effective at dealing with this stuff pull from the yogic uh, and these ancient traditions in spirituality, almost without question. So there are all kinds of methodologies that are being developed that are basically modifications and usually very often just a change of name from a yoga technique. So again, I've been doing this a long time. I still do it because there's a lot of evidence that it works. You know, again, sure, in spirituality, you have the woo-woo, again, sort of fun, fantastical stuff. And usually that's the stuff that, again, isn't going to help you when you get a diagnosis of cancer. It's not going to help you when a loved one dies. It's not going to help you when you have an alcohol addiction. So this is where, again, I sort of feel like the rubber meets the road with spirituality. Is it really going to help you? when you're in trouble? That's the real question. All right, everyone, let's shake it out. And then as usual, if you have a uh, phone timer near you, just set timer for six minutes and then take that time to relax in stillness on your back comfortably in Shavasana. <laughs> 